Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with you today at TED. And uh, I want to talk today about uh, a book I wrote 10 years ago called Good Grief. And I don't think a lot of you actually got to see this book because it ended up in landfill, which I found personally very insulting. Uh, I mean, anyone who wants to write a book, the thing that you're not imagining is the day that your editor calls you and says, hey, um, yeah, all those books we printed, we're about to turn them into mulch. You want any? Uh, it's, it was a sad call. And it, what it made me realize was that uh, this book had serious problems. And we're going to look at it now. Now, I would contend that this book really breaks a lot of rules of what a physical book is supposed to do. And uh, the content itself was you know, fairly straightforward. It's pictures and words uh, in, you know, presented in text. But the platform of the book actually was very, very sort of revolutionary and, and flawed in that way. For, for, one, for one thing, it, uh, it's 700 pages long, and you read it in about 20 minutes. That's a big problem. Another problem, it doesn't really fit on a shelf. It's, a, it's an odd shape. And then the third problem is physical, and that is that it is, um, it breaks. <laughs> it actually, the spine cracks. Books like this aren't actually really possible because uh, the physical paper can't hold it. And it was, you know, it was years later after the fact, after the heartbreak of having put something into the world only to watch it die, that I realized that I had made a digital book in analog form. <laughs> yeah, you're laughing. I wasn't laughing. <laughs> so what does that mean? Uh, well, it means that, and I certainly learned this, you know, when I called my editor and tried to sell my next book, and there, was no, there were no takers, was that if I, I'm a creative person, and that if I was going to have a creative life, I actually had to make this digital and I had to build it digital, and I had to sort of figure out how I could sell something that was digital. And this is a question, this is a big, this is a big problem, like we heard about earlier. This is a big problem. This is not something that you solve in one second. And I spent, and spent the last 10 years trying to figure out what a digital book was. So um, I love to free associate in the world. And what that means is I like to walk around New York City with a problem in my head and just sort of wander in and out of places and think about that problem. And things, I sort of, I, I, I'm open. I, I make myself really open to the visual world around me and I try to see if I can make connections. And one day in 2003, I was walking through the flea market in uh, New York City and I had a total breakthrough. And I saw this little thing. So, this is a lenticular, and I'm going to backlight it so you can see what it actually really is. Um, so this is a lenticular from Star Wars Episode One, And what it is is it's a little toy, right? And it's a little, it's basically a piece of plastic, and there's 24 frames inside it. It's easier to see with the light. Um, there's a little spaceship emerging from another spaceship, right? Okay, I saw this, and it totally changed my life. Because I realized that actually this was the screen where my books belonged. And that this was actually a futuristic glimpse of something to come. To take content and make it interactive. To make it fun. To take a little clip and turn it into a toy. Well, that was a truly meaningful breakthrough for me. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and I, I, I carried this in my pocket for four or five years. Like, I just, I just kept it in my pocket. I kept thinking about it. I kept wondering, you know, how I could integrate this into my life. Well, the next time I really had another breakthrough was about two years later. And I also believe in play. I believe that, you know, my job in reality is to play with stuff, to play with new technology enough that I find new uses for it, that I find a way to work it that hasn't been intended. So one day, I was playing with my, my little trusty iPod Nano. This is, a, this is already a couple generations old. 
So I was playing with it, and I, and I was taking all my pictures, and I was putting it into the photo browser, because you can do that. Because, you know, I, I like to sort of experiment and see what's possible. And I was zipping through my photos really fast, really fast, you know, looking at them, because you can move real fast through photos. And I saw these two pictures of my father. In one case, his hand was up. In the next, his hand was down. And I went back and forth like this, making him hand up, hand down, hand up, hand down. And what I realized was that this was a very primitive flipbook. And that if I actually took the content, and instead of, instead of making it just two frames, but made it, say, 2,000 frames, I could create a different kind of interaction than I'd ever seen on an iPhone, on an iPod. There were no iPhones at this time. So here we go, and this is, this is what I came up with. So this is an example. This is the photo browser. I'll go a little closer for you. And this is an example of a little NFL playing card that I made. And as you can see, now I have control of this experience. And I'm actually now looking at a clip that I can play with, move forward, move back. And my scrolling makes the motion. And this is what we called scroll motion. And what we did was we, because I worked for my day job, was to work for big media client, was big media customers. I made commercials and interstitials and IDs. But my heart was really about this idea of digital publishing. So once I had a platform, once I had a, a little hack that I could work on, I made 90 different versions of it. I made playing cards, and I made digital liner note art, like this one. This is a, this is a classic album, Some Girls. So the idea of forward back, and then actually being able to look at the content. So to open up the album the way the album opens in a beautiful way, and then actually looking at that content, playing with it, even lyrics. So, so this, was, this was something that really got my brain going. And I made a lot of them, and I did it for about two years, and there was no obvious financial way of making a living doing this. It was, it was a disappointment to my loved ones. It was, uh, <laughs> they thought it was very cool, but they were like, that's cool. But you know what would be really cool? You making a living doing something like that. <laughs> you know, you're spending a lot of time on this. And I said, I know, mom and dad, you know, trust me. I believe that this is going to be a meaningful space because what I realized in this, in this idea was that all the content in the world was going to get sold one more time. Everything, every comic book, every novel, every textbook was all going to be living in this space or a space like it. And that what we hadn't seen yet was we hadn't seen actually print media go through a digital transformation. And what I mean by that is that, uh, you know, just because the New York Times put their articles online didn't actually mean it was transformed. And the reason was, was that they didn't charge to have their content online. That the entire notion of the web had dramatically devalued content, which was a very scary thing. And obviously, when newspapers five years ago were this thick, and now are this thick, right, you're seeing what that trade-off has meant. So I, uh, I kept working on this, and then two amazing things happened. The first amazing thing was, that happened was these devices came out, and suddenly all this work that we've been doing for years actually completely made sense. And then the other thing that happened that was quite amazing was the economy crashed, which meant that little mice like me could be running around the big dinosaurs, showing them new technologies and new ways to make money. And the dinosaurs could not afford to actually, you know, do this stuff themselves because they were too busy working, worry about, worrying about their big businesses. So instead, we could go around to big companies and say, hey, guess what? We'd like to make digital books for you. We are Scroll Motion. And so when this all happened, I founded a company with my partner, a brilliant entrepreneur and a brilliant technologist named John Lima. And we basically started building platforms to support all this content coming to these devices especially print content. And uh, in 
November of uh, 2000, I'm sorry, in December of 2008, we actually made our big breakthrough and our big splash, which was when we brought the five major publishers to iTunes, to the App Store for Christmas in 2008. And that was Random House, Simon & Schuster, uh, HarperCollins, uh, Wiley, Perseus, and others that, that we actually brought to the space. Now, I'm also going to fa fast forward because I could take you through our entire product line and tell you all about it, but instead I want to show you what comes next because that is the point of this, uh, this conference. So what comes next is this summer we got asked by Houghton Mifflin Hardcourt and the state of California to produce the first books to be used inside public schools in California. And what I'm going to show you is that. So let's, let's go into, this is, this is Algebra 1, and what you're looking at is not just the, t the thousand pages that they put into a textbook. You're actually looking at the 10,000 additional pages. So not just, not just the content of the book, but all the homework help, all the additional, you know, take-home tests, everything that basically is now in one book. So let's just take a look at what, what's inside this book. So we're now in uh, Solving Inequalities by Adding or Subtracting, one of my favorite topics, as you know. Um, so first of all, it's a scrollable page. You can swipe to move to the other pages so that they're all present. This is all HTML5, which means that it is totally portable across devices other than just the iPad. So let's look at what we have here. Here we have an example. In every example, we have a video. So content that used to live outside of the uh, content that used to live outside on a website now all lives inside this 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 uh, this wrapper. As you can see, he's going to start giving the tutorial, so you, he'll actually begin to uh, solve the problems step by step. In addition, we also have what we call math motion. So in this example, uh, we have the ability to look at it step by step by step. Now, I am a uh, learning disabled math student, so uh, truly, and, uh, and there there's, should be some laughs there, because yes, I mean, like, my my learning math was quite comical. There's a point in my high school career where they were like, you don't have to learn math anymore, it's okay. We, <laughs> we don't want to just do what you're doing. So, uh, so I actually approached this, you know, when I look at a page like this, I'm totally freaked out, right? I just see lots of numbers and, and, and so what, I, what we did was, we felt that the math complexity was greatly enhanced when you could actually look at content slowly, when you could slow it down and give the student the uh, ability, or the teacher, the ability to move slowly. So in addition, I'm also going to show you that we, here's a really, really fine testing module. So here's a check it out. You've got, you can try a problem. Uh, it's asking me about to solve inequalities. I mean, I thought that th that was done with laws, not with, uh, with uh, but we, uh, so we have, you tap on the answer. There's hinting. Wow, correct. Luck. <laughs> um, and uh, there's also, uh, as you can see down here, there's a, uh, there's a scratch pad, so you can draw all kinds of stuff. I mean, is it really a textbook if you can't say Zeppelin rules, if you can't write that down? I, I don't think it is. So um, in addition, we also have, um, we also have things like uh, a really robust notation system. So uh, I want to add a note, click the note, hit add note. Um, what we get is a little movable note that we can uh, change the color of, uh, we can Add an audio note. Oh, I've turned down the sound. Add an audio note. <laughs> uh, and, and also, and, and also uh, have, uh, this is uh, a graphing calculator. So we actually have tools built into the app. So here's a quadratic equation solver. Here's a thing called algebra tiles, which is a whole way of learning algebra using uh, using this experience, and, uh, and really a whole lot of amazing functionality, and uh, the test is going swimmingly. Students are loving it, teachers are loving it, um, but I want to show you one more thing, because I have a little bit of time left, and it is to show you, th that's one type of content. Our platform, Iceberg, actually handles all kinds of content, not just textbooks or magazines or kids' books, but 
any kind of content you can think of because this is really about empowering the future of content creators and the content creators of the past to bring whole new ideas to what this media can be. So this is the all new Esquire magazine. And uh, so this is, <laughs> yeah, pretty fun. I'm just saying, so, do I dare touch? I dare. So, uh, so we have a moving from, uh, from, you can swipe to go from article to article, tap to bring on the, uh, the navigation. There's tons of really, really fun interactivity built into it. So, uh, so here's like, a, this is a watch that you can look at, that you can, hey, scroll motion lives. Look at it. All right. Yeah, it finally found its way into the world. Um, so uh, this is, there's all kinds of really fantastic uses of, of video and audio and uh, interactive experiences, um, things. Uh, so from videos to little audio clips, it's really a very dynamic way to engage all kinds of different content. And Esquire is available right now on the App Store, as is, uh, a whole host of other apps. If you look up Iceberg, you'll see about, I don't know, between nine and 7,000 apps. Again, math, not very good. Um, so the, uh, <laughs> you see a lot of apps that we've done. We've got a lot more coming out. And uh, you know, I just want to come back to the fact that you know, I would not be standing up here today if you had actually seen this book. <laughs> so I guess it just goes to show that, you know, that your failures are really the things that propel you to the next great idea that you have. And that, you know, really it's important that when you're solving big problems and you're really taking on big problems yourself, that you give yourself the amount of time and the seriousness that it takes to actually see an idea through. Because even though, you know, I mean, this is 10 years of work you're seeing on this one, you know, little, little table. And uh, it was very obtuse to get here. But we did get here, so it's my pleasure to talk to you today. Thank you so much.